I want to start with a story. Uh, a friend of mine who's a uh, secretary for a chiropractor, uh, her and her husband were caring for the husband's father. He was living with them. And one day he went downhill, confusion, weakness, sleeping all the time, aches and pains. She figured out uh, that that started when the smart meter went in. Eventually got the smart meter out, and uh, sure enough, uh, he got better. That's a common story. Uh, what's unusual about this story is that when they took the smart meter out, all of a sudden she noticed, oh, she's better too. She had been so focused on uh, her father-in-law she hadn't even noticed how her health had gone down until the smart meter went out. And uh, health, uh, health um, practitioners who are becoming familiar with this say that people are being harmed by this and not knowing that it's the smart meter that's doing it. Uh, the rollout of wireless technology is also having an adverse effect on the environment and our freedom and security. Smart meters are designed to collect information in real time about your activities within your own home. They can tell what electrical appliances and devices you are using and exactly when you are using them. With this information, their algorithms can create a very clear picture of your private life. This is an unprecedented level of surveillance that can be sold to governments and corporations. Worse yet, smart meters are designed to receive information as well as send it. They are designed to receive and implement instructions as to which of your appliances will be allowed to run at what, at what time. They say this is so they can turn down your thermostat at peak times to avoid a blackout. That may sound reasonable, but it's just one function of control that smart meters are capable of. Of course, this also means this control function will be available to any criminal hackers who break into the system, which is transmitting information in a chain from smart meter to smart meter and is not well secured. A better way to avoid electrical power blackouts would be to restore our hydroelectric dams. Instead, they have been charging us on our phone bills to pay for the destruction and removal of our hydroelectric dams. Another way to avoid blackouts would be to stop the implementation of 5G, which is expected to double the portion of energy usage by digital technology in the next five years. You know, adding CO2, if that's something you're concerned about. Although the uh, control function of smart meters has yet to be turned on here in the Rogue Valley, it is there ready to be activated. They are setting up the infrastructure for control. We have a better chance of stopping it before it gets fully implemented. Smart meters are only one part of a technological control grid that will allow an unelected technocracy to control our lives. If you want to get an idea of what that would be like, look up something called China's social credit score. China is a little bit ahead of us. Could the person with the abandoned dog on Riverside please report to the Riverside entrance to retrieve the dog? Thank you. China is a little bit ahead of us in implementing a technocracy where everyone is surveilled and they use people's personal information against them to control dissent. If you think they couldn't do that in America, consider what Edward Snowden revealed that the level of surveillance that the NSA is already doing is unconstitutional, but it's still happening anyway. So many people are fighting back. Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s organization, Children's Health Defense, recently filed an historic lawsuit against the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC, for their role in subjecting Americans to the harm caused by wireless technology. This is great news please go to the actions page of our website for the link on how to donate to this organization to help them win this fight. That's our website address. You can also get there by just typing in freedomtosayno.org. We have uh, business cards on the tables there with our website and email address on them. Another organization that is suing the FCC is called the Irregulators. 
The irregulators is made up of independent experts in the telecom field. Their lawsuit against the FCC exposes one of the largest accounting scandals in American history. The FCC allowed the wireless industry to illegally bypass the fiber optics infrastructure that utility companies had already paid for in their billing. Fiber optics are much safer, more secure, and more reliable than wireless communication, and we've already paid for it. Again, please go to the actions page of our website for the link on how to donate to this organization. Smart meters are a key linchpin in the control grid. So while we support those who are focusing on the dangers of cell towers or stopping 5G, our focus is on smart meters. Our work in Southern Oregon has resulted in the fact that Jackson and Josephine counties have more people opting out of smart meters than any other counties in the state. Yay. We are continuing to build on that because getting smart meters out of a majority of people's homes will cripple their technocratic control agenda. For people who did not opt out of having a smart meter in time and now have smart meters on their home, Pacific Power still says they will charge you $169 to remove a smart meter from your home. Considering the detriment to your health and freedom, I would say that's totally worth it. You can find the link on how to do that on the actions page of our website. However, that $169 is still an illegal extortion fee and is a significant deterrence for a lot of people. So we are working to get that fee eliminated and to get them to allow people to get analog meters back on their homes. So far, over many months of activism, we have succeeded in getting the opt-out fee reduced from a one-time fee of $137 plus $36 a month down to zero one-time fee and only $3 a month. So we have seen that political pressure can work. If you are paying more than $3 a month opt-out fee, go to the actions page of our website and find out how to get the $3 a month rate. Speaking of political action, we have recently created our own Facebook page. Please search for Freedom to Say No on Facebook or go to our website to find the direct link. If you're on Facebook, please find us and like us because Facebook can spread our information to many more people than we have been able to reach so far. And numbers are the key to successful political action. So our first presenter is Alan Rastham, a native Oregonian and retired mechanical engineer. In that profession, he has a bachelor's degree from Oregon State University, a master's degree from San Diego State University, and a retired professional engineer license in the state of California. He is also an active member of Oregon for Safer Technology. Alan? Next month will mark my second year of participating with Oregon for Safer Technology. And during that period, almost two years, uh, I've acquired information that I hope to show you today in terms of an overview. Um, I'm pleased that, to have this opportunity to join this event sponsored by Freedom to Say No to Smart Meters. Before we, make, uh, before we start to look at the slides, I'd like to make a few comments. Um, basically, you can find most of this information on the internet, but it rarely appears in broadcast or printed media. There are two hot subjects in wireless technology today, the smart meters, of course, which Eli spoke well about, and uh, the other one, of course, is 5G technology, uh, for the cellular telecommunications industry. While this technology uh, is of great interest, we're not going to talk too much about that, but rather we're going to look at the general science that applies to both of these subjects. <coughs> Wireless technology provides essential capabilities in certain applications. However, all technologies have their advantages and disadvantages. What, I, what my personal hope is today is that you may have one of the following, one or more of the following takeaways. One, uh, an understanding of the not so obvious disadvantages of wireless technology, an understanding of 
how those disadvantages can be avoided um, by personal choices or minimized, and an understanding of uh, some of the science so that you can decide what wireless devices you really want to buy and how you might use them most safely. And finally, uh, I'm hoping this will motivate you to do your personal research for the details to confirm that what we say is true. An excellent site for that is the Environmental Health Trust website at www.ehtrust.org. As we look at some of the slides, um, I want to give credit to those that I received from Dr. Ed Kellogg. Many of you may have heard him speak as a local scientist. And uh, I also want to give credit to We Are the Evidence, a website that refers to people with electrosensitivity, also known as electrohypersensitivity, also known as microwave sickness. And now I want to make sure that these words are expressed clearly. Hundreds of millions of people use wireless devices with assurances from the wireless industry that these devices are safe or that more studies are needed to show that they are harmful. This presentation will show what thousands of independent scientists and doctors have understood as sound science for more than 50 years, that the disadvantages of electromagnetic radiation exposure are numerous short-term and long-term manifestations of harm to humans and all living things. These are the questions we hope to answer in this presentation. What is electromagnetic radiation, which we call EMR, and how can it affect our health? What is the role of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, with regard to public health and support of the wireless industry? What further evidence do we have that EMR can be harmful, especially for children, perhaps grandchildren? What are concerned people doing about this, and what measures can we take to minimize personal EMR exposure? There is some good news in way to avoid this. As we begin to describe electromagnetic radiation, here are the terms you'll see used frequently, electromagnetic radiation, EMR, radio frequency radiation, which is part of the EMR spectrum. And finally, you've heard people talk about electromagnetic fields, which are basically regions of electromagnetic radiation. There are two main sources, of course. Natural sources of EMR include the sunshine you feel, the, the radiant heat from fire. And the other amazing thing is that all Solids, liquids, or gases above the absolute zero temperature are emitting some level of EMR. When you hold your hand next to your face and you feel that warmth, those, that's EMR. The man-made sources are quite numerous. Smart meters, well known for electric, gas, and water utilities, cell phones, cell towers, cordless phones, baby monitors, wireless facilities, your Wi-Fi, your neighbor's Wi-Fi traditional home appliances, smart appliances, dirty electricity, electric motors, and more. There is a significant difference between man-made EMR and natural EMR. We'll talk about that when it makes a little more sense. All types of waves are characterized by wavelength, intensity, frequency. We're familiar with ocean waves that we can see. Those are waves in the medium itself, the water. What isn't so obvious is how those waves appear in EMR. All electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum travels at the speed of light. That's kind of unusual, but it's uh, 186,300 miles per hour. It's uh, 300,000 meters per second. Um, and if we were to take a snapshot of those waves, as I will show in the next slide, which is kind of taken from a physics book, and it'll give you an idea of why we call it electromagnetic radiation. There are two components, two components in uh, this wave picture. There's an electric field component shown vertically in, in the blue uh, color, 
And then there's a magnetic field intensity shown in the horizontal plane, shown in red. Now, there is a wave-like nature to this, but it's not like an ocean wave. The wave is in the intensity of each field. So if I may just turn aside, looking at the blue wave right here, that, that has a vertical component that's positive upward for a moment, it goes to zero, and then it's positive downward for a moment. That's it's why it's an oscillating field and it occurs in a plane. At the same time, there's a magnetic field that's at 90 degrees from that consistently in its own field. And uh, this is just a general re uh, appreciation for um, the physics, which still leaves a lot to be unsaid. What's important about this slide is because all of this is traveling in a straight line in one direction, it's called a linearly polarized uh, wave. They're, all of these waves are oscillating in their own plane, and it's all going in a straight direction. We'll come back to this. So, the important parameters of any wave phenomena are wavelength and frequency. So now we're going to look at what the frequency looks like. In this slide, you'll see uh, a, a wave of varying wavelength. Wavelength is from peak to peak. And across the top of the slide, you see the various applications that man uses at these different frequencies. And uh, this is the important part of this slide. There's a region to the right where the frequencies are called ionizing radiation. Most people will recognize that ionizing radiation is harmful because it's powerful enough to knock electrons off atoms and molecules. When that happens, uh, bonding changes and Everyone recognizes it's harmful. For example, extended x-rays are harmful, we know that. To the left of that point, which happens to be basically to the left of the ultraviolet uh, zone at the end of the visible spectrum, we have non-ionizing radiation. Typically, these frequencies cannot uh, remove the electrons from atoms. There's two parts to the non-ionizing area. There's an area called thermal radiation, where at a sufficient power level, you can feel a, a hot sensation. Sunburn is an example of, of an overexposure. But then there's also an area called non-thermal radiation. This would be all of those frequencies of EMR that uh, you'd never sense, but which could be harmful. Now, the big debate between the FCC and independent science is that the FCC says, and the industry, if you don't have thermal radiation in those frequencies, you're safe. If you don't feel the heat, you're safe. On the other hand, there are thousands of doctors and scientists now worldwide who are saying this non-thermal radiation is harmful at just about any level. And the effects are what we're going to talk about. In addition, just a quick note, uh, I spoke to um, Dr. Kellogg yesterday briefly on the phone. He said, when you're talking about this, you might mention the science of epigenetics, and no one is even talking about it at this point, but epigenetics are the changes in our gene expression that result from environmental effects. And clearly, this radiation is an environmental effect, totally unexplored, and uh, we'll talk more about this and why man-made radiation is different than natural radiation. There are a lot of details on this slide, but here's what it's intended to show. This is a history of the maximum intensity of radiation that people have experienced over the decades. The green area shows a natural level as a function of frequency across to the right, and what we're showing here is power density. That's like watts per square meter. Uh, that's how, they, how we measure the intensity of, of radio frequency radiation, or EMR. So anyway, in the 50s, you can see how the levels are riding. Uh, in the decades of the 80s, uh, a little higher. The, the red zone is of interest, and even though this may be outdated, if we look at the frequencies uh, that correspond to the peak of the red zone, that's basically where modern phones are operating at about a gigahertz. Uh, 
here's the question, how much has this changed? Well, I know you can't see the numbers, but if you go from the beginning of the 50s to right to the peak of the red at that frequency where our cell phones are used, it's gone up a quintillion times. That is a million, million, million times greater today than uh, when our DNA evolved. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the history and some of the scientific information that confirms the concerns we have. During World War II, of course, we had radar. We had operators suffering from infertility. Uh, they were suffering from headaches and many other factors. But no government organization ever took responsibility for keeping troops safe, uh, especially in wartime. Especially, uh, we wouldn't want the enemy to uh, get an advantage on us if we started to restrict the exposure to our military personnel. So, the first report that I found from the government itself is this report put out by the Navy Medical Research Institute in 1971. This was prepared by a PhD and the title is Bibliography of Reported Biological Phenomena Effects and clinical manifestations attributed to microwave and radio frequency radiation. He looked at over 2,000 reports looking for human effects. These are the disorders that he found. They're listed in the report. These are just the headlines, and then the details follow. But just to give you an overview, heating of organs, physiological function, central nervous system, autonomic nervous system, peripheral nervous system, Psychological effects, behavioral effects, blood, vascular effects, enzymes, and biochemistry. Metabolism, gastrointestinal effects, endocrine, endocrine glands, histology, genes and chromosomes, disorientation of animals in EMFs. It happens even to some of us. This is a book I purchased. Um, written in 1973, issued in Poland, 234 pages, 604 references uh, from the years so shown. Uh, one author was the director of the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Warsaw. Another was the head of Department of Human Genetics, National Research Institute of Mother and Child in Warsaw. Biological effects of microwaves. Let's Let's look at chapter four in the table of contents. And what do we find? Thermal effects of microwave radiation, effects on the nervous system, cardiovascular effects of microwave exposure, endocrine and meta metabolic effects, influence of microwave radiation on uh, male and female genitals, pregnancy and fetal development, chromosomal effects, possible genetic effects, influence of microwave radiation on mitosis, cellular effects, Microwave effects on internal organs, on blood, etc. Miscellaneous effects and comments on the studies, etc. We start to see a similar recognition of the types of harm that are being caused. Sorry. In uh, around 1990, the Labor Institute of New York issued this training workbook for working people. This is uh, a workbook for those who were, were working under high voltage power lines uh, in 1990. This is what they called electromagnetic fields. Here are some of the paragraph titles in this fairly short uh, worker's summary. Cell level experiments provide evidence of biological effects. EMFs affect calcium flow. EMFs affect communication between cells, can interfere with our genes. Animal experience show biological effects too. EMFs may affect reproduction, they may affect the central nervous system and circadian systems of animals and humans. It's time for some humor, so they put up a cartoon. This shows a man uh, taking refuge in a cave, and he's sticking his hand in a sensor through the roof of the cave to kind of measure the environment that he's trying to avoid. And inside he's looking at a meter to see uh, how much protection he's getting. Here's two more significant reports. Now we jump to 1981 or back. This is from a NASA report. And 
and the title is Electromagnetic Field Interactions with the Human Body, Observed Effects and Theories. I want to read a quotation from the abstract. The abstract describes what the paper is going to discuss. Here's what it says. Non-ionizing EMF fields are linked to cancer in humans in three different ways, cause, means of detection, and effective treatment. Bad and benign effects are expected from non-ionizing EM fields, and much more knowledge is necessary to properly categorize and qualify EMF field characteristics. Now that's profound, because at this point in time, we, man had identified all these uh, problems with exposure, but they couldn't put numbers on it. They couldn't put numbers on the amount of exposure or how the, the time of exposure was important. So finally, in 2012, we have the Bioinitiative, a rationale for biologically based exposure standards for low intensity electromagnetic radiation. Scientists, 29 of them from numerous countries all over the world, provided a 1,000 uh, plus page report uh, trying to uh, review 1,800 studies and determine what levels are really safe. Here is a significant paragraph from their conclusions, and with a little research, you'll find tables, uh, pages of, it's called a colored table, because they show the different uh, colors in, uh, for different frequencies and different exposures, but they'll start at maybe a 10,000th of, of what we experience and show what type of harm it causes, and then they'll increase the exposure, listing all of the, the uh, problems with those increased exposures. But here's the bottom line. If we had to summarize the whole report, I believe these words do that. Bioeffects are clearly established and occur at very low levels of exposure to electromagnetic fields and radiofrequency radiation. Bioeffects can occur in the first few minutes at levels associated with cell and cordless phone use. Bioeffects can also occur from just minutes of exposure to mobile phone masts, that's cell towers, Wi-Fi, and, get this, wireless utility smart meters that, proceed, that produce whole body exposure. Chronic base station level exposure can result in illness. The final and perhaps the most important study that we'll refer to today was announced in 2016. The National Toxicology Program Study, the NTP study, this is a U.S. government funded study. Although, and it took 10 years, although it shows $25 million, it spent $30 million with very carefully designed experience, experiments with mice and rats. You may know they're used commonly because their systems represent the human system. So this is the most comprehensive landmark study to date, and it was carefully designed to answer the question once and for all, uh, does this radiation from cell phones cause harm? Well, the conclusion was that it definitely does, and immediately uh, there were influences from the industry to start to discredit the report, and this is the rebuttal from the man who designed the studies, Dr. Ronald Melnick, these are the important points. In spite of the criticism, he says, the NTP study on cell phone radiation shows the null hypothesis has been disproved. That means we've disproven the fact that this is harmless. Proliferative effects were observed in the heart, Schwann cells, and brain, glial cells, that's in the mice. And, and rats. Tumors of the same cell types have been reported in human studies of cell phone users. DNA damage was increased in brains of exposed rats and mice, and the animal data are relevant and useful for assessment of human health effects. Now we can switch to another question. What is the role of the Federal Communications Commission with regard to public health and the support of the wireless industry. This is the famous statement uh, from the Telecommunications Act of 1996, signed by Bill Clinton. 
Uh, I'll read the words first and then uh, I'll translate it. No state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the Commission's regulations concerning such emissions. What that means is states, counties, and cities cannot stop the placement, construction, and modification of cell towers or other wireless facilities based on environmental effects as long as public RFR exposure does not exceed limits in FCC regulations. Fine. Well, a federal judge has ruled that environmental effects include human health effects. That defies any definition in Black's legal dictionary. That's where we are. Well, how could this be? Well, let's compare the FCC regulations in this country with those in other countries. Look where we are on the far right. We're tolerating an outdoor pulsed radiation frequency exposure limit and power density, they call it microwatts per square centimeter, of 1,000. Now let's look where China and Israel are. They're at a tenth of that. Now let's look at where Russia and France are. Those two countries have studied this problem more than any other countries in the world. They're at a hundredth of what the U.S. allows in terms of this radiation exposure. Well, let's dig a little deeper. This is the reason. Captured Agency is a report prepared by the Harvard University Ethics Department. And they are saying how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. This report has 59 pages, and I'm going to give you a quick summary. It's, it gives detailed accounts of agency history. It cites the revolving door of executive managers between the FCC and wireless industry. And it gives accounts of industry reactions to adverse research findings and reports. One quick example. Tom Wheeler, you may or may not have heard of, he was at one time the CEO of the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association. That association donated $700,000 to Obama's election. Obama appointed Tom Wheeler to head the Federal Communications Commission. Here he was the CEO of the industry uh, organization. Now we're going to try to answer another question. What further evidence do we have that EMR can be harmful, especially to children? Here's a study by Dr. Gandhi at the University of Utah, who showed, and it shows how the brain is penetrated depending on how old you are. Young children have a thinner skull, so you give maximum penetration from a cell phone. Adults have a thicker skull. That's about all this is intended to show. One of the incidents reported in the captured agency document concerns Dr. Gandhi. He received a call from this cellular communications provider uh, saying, you know, if you don't stop your research on children, we're going to cut your funding. And he decided that uh, in an ethical way that he should not be influenced by that. He continued his studies. And sure enough, his funding was cut. They told him stop the project and return the money. Here's another uh, study that was done. It shows the influence of the cell phone on the brain in terms of glucose metabolism. The photo at the left shows a lot of yellow areas when the phone is on. That shows the brain is processing a lot more glucose uh, than when the phone is off. At this point, let's see a show of hands for those in the audience who feel they have electrosensitivity now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Very good. And now let's show, have a show of hands of those who know of people who have this problem. You know, it's amazing. This became a topic of study a long time ago. In 2006, an investigator looked at the trends 
among several countries in Europe. And uh, by 2006, they had established a, a pretty good trend showing 10% of the population has this sensitivity. And they projected by 2017, half the world population would have this sensitivity. And going to the next slide, I want to introduce it a bit. Dark field microscopy is a microscopic examination of blood cells that's typically used to identify the presence of oxidative stress. It does turn out that uh, an EMR exposure does cause oxidative stress. So, in the winter edition of the Western A. Price Journal in 2014, uh, an article appeared with some photos uh, showing the following experiment. Subjects were um, invited to participate. They took blood samples initially, restricting their use of food and exercise for so many hours. They took a blood sample. Then they put a cell phone in receive mode in a backpack on each of these subjects. And then they had these subjects use a cell phone for 45 minutes. So the next slide is going to show how that affected their blood at each phase. At the top left, you'll see healthy blood cells. This is the way everyone's blood should look under dark field microscopy. For the 75-year-old female and the 55-year-old male at the far left, we see what their baseline condition was. Then after 45 minutes, just wearing the phone in receive mode on their backpack, we can see that the blood is starting to collect and stick together a bit. And then after 45 minutes of active phone use, we see very serious changes in the blood. And when the blood clusters like this, it's not going to pass through your fine capillaries easily. Now, just so you understand that this is occurring just near the brain, on the far right, we see from a 55-year-old female what the blood looked like from her fingers and what it looked like from her toes. Pretty serious uh, changes in structure. Another area where we have evidence of a harm is perforation of the blood-brain barrier. Now, this particular slide on the left shows uh, a section from probably a rodent brain uh, in the absence of any dye. Basically, the experiments inject dye into the rat, and then they confirm that there's no, nothing in the brain. Then they'll expose uh, the rodent to a certain cell phone uh, activity, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, they, the brains develop the dye. Well, the significance of this is that, and it happens to humans again, as that Bioinitiative report in 2012 said, just a couple minutes of this, and uh, the heavy metals, the viruses, the bacteria are now entering the brain. In studies of areas of the brain that are susceptible to cancer, you may remember that one reference was made to glial cells. So here's a study uh, referenced to 1995 that looks at all cancers in areas of the brain and compares them as the years progressed with that baseline in 1995. So it turns out that the incidence rate is really increasing in the temporal and frontal lobes. That's where people are using their phones. But in other areas of the skull, not susceptible to that exposure, they are not experiences the, the higher incidence of cancer. Speaking of cancer, uh, there's a problem. Many women have kept the phone in their, bra their bras, and the cancer patterns in some cases actually show where the antennas were in the phone. So here's a, a quick summary of the adverse health effects. We talked about aggregation, the chain linking, also called Rouleau in, in the blood to blood analysis world, and we've seen the misshaping of blood cells. I, I didn't point it out, but in that third slide, after 45 minutes of this, the blood cells are actually no longer circular. Their, their perimeter uh, geometry is, is getting shriveled. 
So we have the short-term manifestations, the, ag the ag aggregation, and then the perforation of the blood-brain barrier. That happens right away, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not. The long-term manifestations are the electrosensitivity and the development of DNA damage in cancer, which takes five to ten years, and that's why it's so easy to claim there's no evidence of harm because it's slow acting, serious and slow acting. I just learned about this within the last few weeks, why the man-made radiation is so much more harmful. And this appeared in a technical paper with this title. Actually, it was from 2014. Polarization, a key difference between man-made and natural electromagnetic fields in regard to biological activity. I won't try to pronounce the, the author's names, but I feel this is really important. And it is technical, but it does explain why there's a difference. And we're going to refer back to the diagram that I showed called linearly polarized waves. Polarized EMR creates increased biological activity, whereas non-polarized natural EMR does not. Here are the reasons why. First, this is really important, most man-made EMR is linearly polarized. That's the diagram we showed exactly, which means waves, waves travel in phase in parallel two-dimensional planes. We're not talking about just one diagram, but an infinite number, all in phase, traveling at the same time from a man-made source. Natural EMR waves have polarization planes in random orientations. In other words, the EMR from the sun has so many infinite number of sources that it cannot be uniformly polarized with the same effect. So let's explore this a little more. Polarized EMR from two or more sources can produce constructive interference patterns with amplified intensity at the wave intersection points. Here's an analogy. If you were to throw two stones into water at the same time, you would see the riffles traveling towards each other. Wherever those waves intersect, you would see an, an increase in the height momentarily. The same thing is happening if you have two cell towers. The, 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 the radiation from each of those towers can be reinforced in certain areas. And what makes it even more complicated is that if you have different frequencies at different locations, these hot spots can be moving from place to place. They can hit you in one spot and, and not bother you for a while. It's just a, a dynamic a chaos. Point number three, polarized EMR causes oscillations in charged particles. That's kind of a concept in physics because, again, the man-made is unique. Everything's traveling in phase. All the waves are together. They're all parallel, and they can move charged particles. Well, in our body, we have charged particles called molecules that are either charged or they're polar molecules. They're ions, which are charged uh, particles in solution inside and outside cells, all of these particles can begin to oscillate in the influence of man-made EMR. I've never seen this called out in any discussions. You know, they refer to the frequency spectrum, but they don't point out this major difference. The oscillations occur in parallel planes with the frequency of the radiation, the EMR. Now we can kind of get into why this is a problem. The oscillations create additional voltages on cell membrane sensors. Those sensors are intended to regulate the content of the ions in the cell, the ions of sodium, potassium, and calcium, and so forth. The additional voltages cause what's called irregular gating. It allows too much of some of these ions to enter the cell resulting in total disruption of the electrochemical balance and eventually DNA damage and cancer. Beyond that, we know from smart meters and many other electronic devices that we have pulsed EMR. If you look at the output from the smart meter, it's pulses. And in my way of thinking, the pulse is a blast. 
as opposed to just an oscillatory force. It's, it's a really a hard-hitting uh, influence on the cells. I should quickly add that Dr. Martin Paul, Professor Emeritus from Washington State University, has identified the paths chemically inside the cell that result from this, and it's called voltage-gated calcium channels. In other words, each cell membrane has little protein structures that regulate the ions in the cell. He has shown, and it's been inter accepted internationally, that the EMR arriving there is opening that calcium gate artificially, and that's what's leading to the consequences that we just described, voltage-gated calcium channels. Well, it isn't just uh, humans and, and uh, mammals that are being affected. Uh, plants are affected. You can see what's happened to this vine near a smart meter. We see trees uh, that suffer from this exposure. Notice the limbs near the antenna are missing. I have even read some account that in Europe, as they're bringing on 5G, they're removing trees with some excuse. But I think part of the reason is that this radiation will be killing the trees or making it noticeable how harmful they are. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about social consequences. We've been talking about issues of bodily harm, but the social effects can be very profound and again, long term. This is a book called Irresistible by Adam Alter. And uh, it's the subtitle, if you can't read it, is The Rise of Addictive Technology in the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. And someone has reported to me that, um, you know, the media tell us that the U.S. must win the race with China for implementing uh, fifth generation technology, 5G, and China is ahead of us. Well, I ask, what's at the finish line? In light of this book, 25 million teens in China are addicted to screen time to the point where they wear diapers, some of them, to avoid the distraction of bodily functions. Yes. China has 400 treatment centers for this. The addiction of screen time is preventing the development of certain neural pathways in the brain in our youth. Another book uh, has some similar information by Dr. Jean Twenge. iGen, why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. Well, she, what she has done is she selects specific personality traits and compares today's iGen, that's the generation that's grown up totally during the period of cell phones, comparing their characteristics with those in previous generations. And she has a way of scoring this. Um, the book really doesn't acknowledge the cause of these factors, uh, the decline in intellectual, emotional, and social maturity. And uh, it's only reasonable to ask, could it be EMR exposure and the failure to develop certain brain pathways? Could it be that exposure and some of the adverse health effects, which maybe uh, haven't even dis been discovered yet? And could it be just the addiction to screen time or on unhealthy psychological influence from peer groups. Uh, a former neighbor of mine said by necessity she had to give her 13-year-old son a cell phone and she said his personality has changed dramatically with that influence. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a quick slide from uh, that book, uh, an image again contributed by Dr. Ed Kellogg. It basically just compares uh, how depressive symptoms in youth, this is for 10th graders, has increased in, in, uh, in line with smartphone adoption. And just to show that it wasn't uh, uh, a depressive uh, reaction from unemployment, unemployment was declining at that point. There are many other examples of, of harm. Uh, I'll just summarize it quickly. California, for a while, allowed cell towers on fire stations. The firemen became so dysfunctional with that exposure that they'd be in the middle 
of an ambulance run and they would be forgetting the procedures to care for the patient. This became so serious, finally uh, some private citizen funded MRIs of their brains and there was clear evidence of uh, effects from the cell towers and as a result the California legislature has now exempted fire stations from uh, the installation of cell towers. Re retired uh, combat jet pilots now are getting cancer from that cockpit exposure to uh, that type of radiation. The Russian health ministry advises people under 18 should not have a cell phone and Wi-Fi is being removed from elementary schools in Europe. What are concerned people doing about this? Well, there's a, more lawsuits than we can count. This is quite an old list. The final slide um, hopefully will share some good news, things you can do to kind of protect yourself. On your person, for heaven's sakes, uh, turn off cell phones, iPhones, iPads when they're not in use. You may know that, as was the case in the backpack experiment, when the cell phone is on, it's still communicating with the tower so that you're being exposed. And the, the worst case uh, is if you're in a car, you're inside what's called a Faraday cage. And it's a double whammy. First of all, the phones know how to boost power to reach the tower when it's, when it's possible. They will boost it up and, and cause you more harm. But inside the car, that energy is reflected back to you. So you're getting a, a super dose by having it near you because it's higher power inside. And then there's the reflections from all the metal around the car. The same thing sort of happens if you only see two bars on your phone. That means the cell tower is kind of far away and it's going to boost the power to make sure you have a good phone call. In your home, for heaven's sakes, Remove smart meters, whatever it takes. Wi-Fi, cordless phones, smart appliances and devices. Turn off circuit breakers at night in sleeping areas. Use wired technology, that's the answer, that's the good news. Ethernet, fiber optics, and a landline. You can use your iPhone, your iDevices with an Ethernet connection without using wireless. In your community, avoid the cell facilities, Wi-Fi people using wireless devices. Some people call this wireless exposure the new tobacco, the new cigarette. We, we actually have the tobacco science and we have the harm of um, EMF exposure similar to the carcinogenic, carcinogenic effects of tobacco. Do personal research on protective devices um, and the shielding materials you can buy for your body. There's clothing, there's treatments for the walls of your home, but uh, check warranties and see uh, what the policy is on returns. And then part of the effort of freedom to say no to smart meters, part of the effort for working for safe technology is to really work on elected officials. Uh, this change can only come from the public. It's not going to come from the government as a top down. That concludes uh, this presentation. So my name is Bridget Krause, and I perform in this area under the stage name as a singer-songwriter as Bridget Wolf. And I am a volunteer um, also. Like all of the um, steering committee members, we're volunteers, and I've been with on the steering committee of Freedom to Say No to Smart Meters for a couple of years now, and grateful for this group. I am a citizen, activist, and a wellness advocate. I'm going to um, also present a bit of an overview of what we're dealing with regarding smart meters and provide some updates. And I'll mention some of our collective accomplishments with gratitude to everyone who's helping in this fight for our health and consumer choice. Since we're in the library and the Wi-Fi is very high and there is a cell tower just outside, I have typed up what I'm going to read because my brain may and already has started short-circuiting. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
yet. And I'm having about 10 other symptoms, which are really uncomfortable right now. I would, I don't know if a cell phone announcement was made, but if you could, it would help me very much if you could turn your cell phones off, or at least put them on airplane mode if you haven't already done so. Because as a highly sensitive person, I can feel things and make connections that not everyone seems to be able to feel and to describe. In 2010, I had a cell phone injury. So I know the dangers of wireless radiation firsthand. I had, um, did get a doctor's note and got out of my contract with US Cellular. I have not had a cell phone for nine years. I made a choice. When the cell phone injury occurred, I had facial numbness and tingling on the entire left side of my face after using the flip phone next to my left ear. I have learned to use a measuring device. I have several, but today I brought an acoustometer, which measures invisible wireless radiation and electromagnetic fields. This is to help me know how much I'm being exposed to. There's a dial that I can turn on. and can hear the static caused by wireless radiation and electromagnetic fields. And there is a color-coded panel. It's in the... But depending on where I stand in the room, it, it goes from the mid-red to the high-red range. Green being safe, yellow being a warning. And I'm getting really emotional just looking at it. The red is definitely when radiation levels are higher than safety guidelines. And these devices are used by a growing number of building biologists and other practitioners and just regular people um, to help know what we're being exposed to. You can also use a transistor radio by turning to an AM channel that has no station coming through it. The amount of static you hear gives an idea of how much electromagnetic fields are coming off of laptops, TV, TVs, appliances, smart appliances, smart meters, and you have then choices to make. When the electric company Pacific Power decided to install smart meters without our consent, I went around to several areas where there were digital meters already installed and took measurements with this acoustometer. I noticed that all digital utility meters gave off radiation. The analog meters did not and do not give off radio frequency radiation. I knew I had to opt out of a smart meter. As the smart meters were being installed at the apartment complex in Talent, where my partner Tim and I lived for many years, I took measurements. The radiation was so high I was angry. A friend who didn't believe there was any concern stood with me between two of the big apartment buildings. I took measurements of the 18 smart meters, nine smart meters on each wall. Again, the radiation level was in the highest of the high red zone. Very unhealthy. My acoustometer was maxing out like it does when I'm near a cell tower like with the cell tower across the street from this library. It was very scary, and my friend had symptoms. She had been skeptical, but when she lost her balance, after just being there for a few minutes, with just a few minutes exposure to the smart meters, she did agree to post a laminated sign near her analog meter, do not install smart meter. And she alerted me when the man from the company, Eclara, which is also the name of the smart meters, came to install the smart meters so that I could speak up and make sure no smart meters were installed on my building. Today, I measured, I was going to measure the radiation, but I didn't even dare go out there. I parked on this side. It's just 
wanted to be my best for you. I didn't want to come to this library to do the presentation, but I am here because I knew what the health cost would be. But I'm here because I care very much. And we need help to create a movement of people to get the attention of the decision makers to begin to get our rights back. In wireless zones, I have difficulty concentrating, I feel shooting pains in my head and joints, I get mood swings, stomach aches, nauseous, and get insomnia. I get super depressed, and I have even had suicidal thoughts. I continue to see a therapist for post-traumatic stress. Some of, here are some of the illegalities. The meters themselves are not approved. They don't even meet federal government's, the Federal Communications Commission guidelines, and the smart meters were not tested. They were not third-party tested by a company named Tesco, according to an employee of the Oregon Public Utility Commission, Mike Cochrane. Under oath, in, on September, in September 2018, Mr. Cochrane said that the smart meters were not tested. And from our measurements, we know that they do not pass the federal government's very low standards. Some accomplishments through our collective efforts, as Eli said, we got the initial opt-out fee of 137 removed. And uh, we got the $36 a month fee reduced to $10 a month, and for equal pay, uh, customers on the triannual read where they come out three times a year instead of 12 you can pay three dollars a month I have outlined the steps to take and there's a sheet on the back table it is also from Pacific Power's own website and while Eli was saying about they will probably still tell you when you call them to request a non-communicating meter that there is a $169 fee to have it, the smart meter taken off or to have the digital meter taken off to get a non-transmitting digital meter, which Tim and I have. We never got charged the $169. So, um, and there are numerous people who have not been charged for whatever reason. But it still says on their website they will charge. And you'll know if it's a meter with, that does not radiate because the meter reader won't be able to read from the vehicle down the driveway or down the street. They'll have to come up to the meter and read it the old way. Sorry, I was... I'm having a hard time. It can take a few months for the meter to be changed out. If you are having health issues, please tell them this and ask for a non-transmitting digital meter as soon as possible. People who continue to call them have gotten results and the smart meters get changed out. If you have a pacemaker or metal inside you, please call them right away. Doctors in the Valley have warned people with pacemakers to stay away from smart meters. If you are on disability, please tell them or demand reasonable accommodation under the American Disabilities Act and urge them to hurry up and change out the smart meter for a non-communicating digital meter. They won't let us have analog meters at this time, but we are fighting to change that and one of our goals is to get analog meters back, at least the choice to have an analog meter. One of the myths that we hope folks begin to look at is the myth that smart meters are safe because government industry and the Public Utility Commission say they are safe. They are not safe. We the people have the opportunity to take a stand and just say no to smart meters. I do have a few more signs like the sign that was just outside the door. They're in my car. I will um, accept a donation. Um, if you're able to stay to the end, let me know and I will help you also take a stand. We are needing volunteers and uh, it would be wonderful if you would talk to us and see what skills you have. 
that could help us in this fight. Thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate you. All right, my name is Tom McLean. I'm a chiropractor in North Ashland, and I've been working with um, this for some years now. I'm on the learning curve just like uh, most folks here in this room, and I continue to find out things. Um, what set me off of this, I, I was suspicious of a microwave for some time, I heard about it, you know, it's a foggy notion. But what set it off for me is one day a gal showed up at the office and she was a uh, teacher from Southern California. And she says, I'm looking for a Wi-Fi free community. Is Ashland it? I said, no, I'm sorry, it's just loaded with uh, uh, digital meters that are blasting out a microwave continuously. It's uh, a ruse that they use to fool the people of Ashland. They think they don't have smart meters, which they don't, but they're being really exposed. And of course, now they're trying to push 5G. But she said, uh, well, I was a teacher down in uh, uh, Southern uh, California there, and the state required four cell antenna on the ceiling, not the roof, but the ceiling in my classroom for all the mandated uh, state tests. And she said, just immediately afterwards, the students got headaches and nosebleeds. It's pretty dramatic. And after a short amount of time, she did too, and she had to quit. Well, that was my tipping point. I realized then I did this. So I went out, the first thing I did is uh, bought a meter. This is a cornet meter, costs about 169 bucks, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, let's see. Oh, <clears throat> um, in the back of the room, there's this brochure. I ordered it from this group. This guy is a real activist. By buying one of these, uh, you're helping him out and helping us all out. I tend to, I, I think one of these, the very the simplest meters, but I think everyone who has a family, cares about their children, and themselves, and their health, should have this. And it does do the same thing. Green is safe, yellow is uh, warning, and red is lookout. And we're kind of in the red zone here. We're being uh, cooked even as we speak. I appreciate Bridget uh, being here, and I know it's really hard uh, for some of us to be here. I feel the um, redness in my face, and I my, uh, tend to get a little achy in the eyes. I don't have as strong as symptoms as some, but I'm, I'm, I can feel it. Um, anyway, so I, I started noticing patterns of symptoms from people coming to see me. I, uh, I use something called applied kinesiology, which is an interface between chiropractic and acupuncture. So you're working with the electrical system of the body to find out what's going on via muscle testing and so forth. I started noticing really uh, unexplained patterns. Uh, people would have the insomnia, they would have the headaches, uh, different meridians would not be working, and it was uh, puzzling for me. But as I started to learn about all of this and started putting things together, um, I started realizing the people that are having the uh, AFib going on, the thyroid problems, and so forth and so on, uh, that it was being connected to their exposure. And uh, I had some, uh, as I say, part of my learning curve, talking about that tower out there. One of the first cases I had was <clears throat> A worker who has an office over there, she's part of a, a, a group there, and her symptoms was that she couldn't stop her hands and her legs from shaking. She had acute brain fog, a high anxiety level, and so forth. And uh, she would notice that as she drove away from the office, her symptoms would just get less and less. And by the time she got home, about 20 minutes of being home, all the symptoms back at the office, it was really bad. So I went down with this little doodad meter plus the uh, radio. It was really amazing. Um, uh, there was nowhere in the office that wasn't high, just like it is here in this room. Um, speaking of which, out at the uh, front door, it's three times as high as they allow in China. Um, Alan pointed out, I want to say that again, uh, China, France, Italy, the highest amount they allow is 10 microwatts per square meter. And in this country, it's a thousand. So it's 10 in China, Italy, France, 
and it's a thousand here, and it's because of that captured agency. And I would add that our uh, government is a captured agency. Anyway, so uh, as I was walking around, I had the transistor radio too. All of a sudden, that radio exploded. Just huge noise everywhere I went in the room. Larger, almost as large as the office, large as this room. And it wasn't until I walked out about 30 feet out into the middle of the street that the radio calmed down. But it's like this huge cloud of dirty electricity. Where did it come from? Well, it turned out it was an overcast day, but then the sun came out, hit the solar panels next door, and when that kicked in, it kicked in the, um, when you convert direct current that comes from the solar panels to the alternating current. There's a little transistor uh, that happens with that converter. And that creates dirty electricity. A lot of people think, oh, solar panels, we're being very environmentally correct and helpful and so forth. Well, there's a price. There's a price for everything. And that's what happened uh, in, in her situation. When that kicked in, I mean, she was having all kinds of symptoms and so forth. And that, she was about a block away. We're about, I don't know, three blocks away. But it was very intense. Um, um, I've seen one person, uh, acute, uh, she came, I, I've seen her for several years, and then she developed AFib. And, uh, and I realized she was living next to the um, uh, Southern Talent cell tower. And I've been begging her for all these years to uh, get out of there as quick as possible. But um, then now our husband has developed heart symptoms, big heavy duty construction guys. So they're finally now they're, they're starting to uh, move. Um, I'm supposed to talk about what you can do for yourself. Uh, Health-wise and so forth, just think of all this microwave as increasing inflammation in the body. So you do all the things you know to decrease inflammation in the body. That means to eat right organic foods, uh, stay away from all the processed foods, sugar, trans fats, and so forth. Um, I would get a good multiple vitamin uh, mineral. I asked the uh, uh, nutritionist at the Ashland Co-op, what's the best one he recommended, he just reached out and pulled a one called uh, Pure Essence, and it's a, a whole foods, uh, natural vitamin. I would add uh, green drinks to that to help to bring the inflammation down the body. There are a lot of, a lot of things you can do at uh, home. Uh, if you want to send away for a uh, blocking of your smart meter, uh, you can pay $130 or you can go down to Ace Hardware and get one of these things for 10 bucks. Uh, a lot of things uh, you can put inside to make that snug. Um, these are sold in uh, um, 4 feet by uh, 10 feet rolls like this. Uh, it's aluminum. They found that um, Three feet of concrete or a thin roll of this, about the same. So it's uh, these aluminum reflectors are really something you can do for yourself. So and that's about uh, 25 bucks. Um, Where do you get that? At Ace Hardware. You can buy, um, if you're, you, you know, and, and an inside of something like this, if you have a smart meter on the wall and the, in, the inside, you want to put something to block it so it's not coming into the house. Put something on the wall. Uh, I know money is a uh, problem for some people. You can get a smart blanket uh, that comes like this. You can buy this down at Bymart, um, and they're like two bucks or so. So there are some cheap things you can do, but distance is your friend when it comes to dirty electricity and exposure to microwaves. So um, that's really a key point. How much time do we have? Four, okay. Um, so anyway, a, a good diet is fresh organic foods. Your diet should be approximately 80% alkalizing, which would be fruits and vegetables, so mostly vegetables. Uh, 
Some people need to, I see what happens with people with the muscle testing. Some people get along with grains and some people don't. Same with milk products. Um, those are like two keys where people either get along or don't get along. But you want to find a diet that works for you that's uh, non-inflammatory. Just think of microwave as increasing inflammation in the body. Um, I had another, uh, I have so many stories that you can probably talk another hour on, but uh, one gal, she was a, uh, in her 30s, and she started having all kinds of brain fog, can't, couldn't remember anything, and so forth. Uh, so she went from being a former marathoner to uh, hardly being able to drive her car, and, and uh, I found out where she lived. She lived in, uh, in Talon, at the north end of uh, Talon, near uh, uh, Info Structure. There's another big cell in Tana. She lived about a block away. And uh, so they did an MRI of her brain, because she was like, here she is in the early 30s. She had plaques all over her brain. These are things that you can really see now. According to the medical folks, that would be anecdotal. And so we have all these anecdotal uh, stories, and they say, well, that doesn't, you don't have any proof. Well, it is true. We don't know um, how, how to actually quantify the damage microwave is doing. We know it accumulates over time. Uh, but we don't know if, like being in this room right now, is this equivalent to smoking one cigarette, a pack of cigarettes, a half a carton of cigarettes? Damage is happening. Our bodies are constantly being broken down and repaired. We have repair mechanisms, but you need the ingredients to do that. That's why diet is so important. It's really uh, important to try to sleep in a green zone because that's when your body's repairing itself. It would be really great to turn off the electricity to your room, uh, to your sleeping area. If microwave was going to kill us, we'd all be dead. We'd never make it out of this uh, room if it was immediate, but it's not. It's slow, it's accumulative, and so forth. It's like an increased, uh, increased aging factor. So you do the best you can, you minimize your exposure, you eat as best you can, you take care of your health as all the things you've ever heard about taking care of your health, that's uh, real crucial on that. So um, uh, we're going to have, um, I hope you're writing questions. We're going to be in the back after the talk and uh, uh, we're going to answer the questions uh, as we're up here. So if you have, uh, I know there's so much more I can say, but I'm going to just wind it up here. So thank you. I'm glad to meet everybody. I'm Vicki Simpson, and um, I've had a lot of jobs in my working career that have informed me about, about food webs, the food web we're a part of, about watersheds and how they work. And all of the things I learned there are informing me about this search into what about man-made microwave radiation. And so I've learned so much, and about like others that have spoken, it's been about two years for me diving in and one curiosity has led to uh, answers and then brought up more questions. And so today what I want to do, <clears throat> my job is to talk to you about animals. And uh, I'm also like Bridget, really feeling the effects of this room. We've been here for a few hours by now. So bear with me we'll, and I think you'll like what uh, you might learn from this talk. Um, so I want to give you an animal perspective of what it's like to live in the modern world. We've got two competing uh, wireless communication systems going on. And the first one is Earth's natural sea of background radiation. And the other one we've got is the new technology, which is very sophisticated, but it doesn't incorporate safety in any way, shape, or form. And those two things are incompatible, especially for all animals and plants. And we are animals as well. We have to remember that. We think we're special, but we're kind of not. We depend on the Earth's natural background radiation every bit as much as every animal, plant, and tree, and microbe on the planet. So I want to go back about three and a half billion years 
And you can see, if you imagine, our little blue marble in the, in the space, about 93 million miles from the sun, and which is not a very big distance when the sun is throwing and bombarding us with charged particles. And it would be, we'd be all toast if that just hit our planet. We'd burn up. But we have a magnetic core to our Earth, which sets out a field all around the Earth and is always between us and the sun. And so it's protective. It, it shuns off most of the of charged particles out into space. And it also allows in enough that sparked life about three and a half billion years ago. And it also feeds life and sustains life now. So if you're a, an animal, other than humans, you know that every day you rely on Earth's background radiation in order to accurately orient and negotiate your environment. So it, it's like if a bee, well, let's put it this way. Um, every place on Earth is emanating charged particles. And every organism, every living thing, has a biofield. For instance, each one of you sitting here in the audience has a biofield. It's kind of the sum and total of all the electromagnetic impulses that you use at a cellular level to run all your systems. And so, Aaliyah in the front row is very calm. And you could sit next to her, and it would be a really good thing, because we know about biofields that if you have a really coherent, steady heartbeat, it induces in your brain a nice, steady brainwave pattern. And the people sitting next to you, if you're in that state, will start to pick it up from you. And pretty soon, their heart rate will be the same, and bravely brainwave patterns will be the same. It's probably that way when mothers hold their babies or fathers hold their babies. So let me get a drink of water. I'll be back. So Earth's wireless is essential for all plants and animals. As I said, microbes, trees, insects, everything. And we, so we have to be in touch for for getting data that we need in order to survive. We also need it for a second reason. And that reason is that it powers our biology. Alan told you about how we are electromagnetic beings down to the cellular level. And so without that, we don't exist. But people don't know it. The only thing people can sense is light and consciously. We sense light and we sense infrared heat. And that, it takes like a lightning storm to catch our attention. But our bodies are responding all the time to all of Earth's natural magnetics, unless, electromagnetics, unless we are subsumed by man-made <coughs> artificial waves. And as Alan said, those are polarized, they're more powerful, they are more impactful, uh, they can change and disrupt the chemical balance in each and every cell. And, and we have trillions of cells. And our biofield for a person and an animal our size would be the same, um, amounts to something in totality like a 50 watt bulb. So we can all think of ourselves as 50 watt bulbs. Uh, we're putting out about that much energy. Well, you can guess that anything that harms one animal or one plant is going to harm another because we're very similar and we're even similar to plants. Uh, plants have something called turgerines and they're analogous to our neurotransmitters in our brains and turgerines tell a plant when to open cell pores on the leaves to regulate their moisture and their CO2 and they tell the leaves when it droops so, to save their energy when it's really hot in the summer. And other, and other likenesses between um, people and other animals and plants and trees is that we all have DNA. And you know that DNA is our instruction booklet for how we work every day in every way. And it's also our code book for how to reproduce ourselves and come up with the same species. 
So as Ellen was talking about all of those dangers that we face from the, uh, the very impactful uh, man-made radiation, we know that DNA, both single and double strands, can be broken. And if they don't heal back by enzymes in the vicinity, and if they heal back wrong, maybe they get crossed, we've just created a, a mutation that is irreversible. So when I give you some examples of what happens in nature, um, people all over the world, mostly in other countries, not here, because of closing down of the experiments, which the industry has really pushed to have happen. In other places, um, I'll tell you about field studies and about laboratory studies, which um, show you what I'm talking about in, in detail for specific animals. So animals all have depend on this every day, wherever they go. They have the ability to pick up just the right amplitudes and frequencies for data that they need. So a bumblebee, for instance, is going to go look for a piece of land that, uh, if it's a certain kind of native bee, it's going to look for an alfalfa patch. Those are very specialized native bees, a leafcutter bee. And it's going to know from the electromagnetic identity of the area, it can tell on the wind that it's getting close and it's going to go to the right kind of field in order to forage. And um, parts of the, the bee itself are uh, magnetized. It's, it has electromagnetic energy all over. And the hairs on the back legs where it would carry pollen is one charge, and pollen is the opposite charge, which helps the pollen to stick. So it's going to forage, and while that bee is out there looking for an alfalfa field, it's also going to be aware of weather, and all of the information about a weather front that's coming is electromagnetic in nature. So the bee is going to be able to judge, ah, the weather's changing. It looks like this is going to be cold. I'm going to forage for a little bit longer, and I'm going back to the hive for shelter. And this is important when you think about bee colony collapse syndrome. It's something that I don't ever hear anybody consider when they're thinking about the mysterious disappearance of bees that started about 2006. And we have to think about it, even though we've already got a whole bunch of stuff on our agenda about habitat uh, destruction. We have to redo that. We have to restore streams. We have to take care of our earth better than we are. But animals are out there on their own trying to make it, right? And so um, we need to think about the fact that uh, when bees are attacked by something like a mite or a parasite or some kind of uh, like a GMO, maybe GMO pro, uh, fields are um, uh, interfering with their biology. Any of the things that normally we, have, we think will affect bees um, are not going to account for the fact that in colony collapse, collapse syndrome, no bees are found back at the hive. But we do know from studying bees that with man-made microwave technology, bees can be disabled in their navigational abilities by either microwave range radiation or by low wave radiation. So they simply maybe can't come back because in this colony disorder, we find that there are no bees left at the colony. They just simply don't return. It's healthy one year. Next year, there are no bees. There aren't sick ones laying around that we can analyze to find out what's going on. So it's something we need to keep in mind. Um, let's see, I want to talk a bit about trees, too because, again, we have our similarities. We're, we're living creatures on the earth. A lot of trees were studied in uh, Bamberg and Hallstatt, Germany. And they were studied for over 10 years, from 2006 about to 2016. And what the researchers found was that healthy trees would start to deteriorate about one to two years after the installation of the cell tower antenna. And um, the trees that were in the beam of the antenna would start to deteriorate now and showed you a slide where it would be the top portion of the tree which would begin to deteriorate. The leaves would turn glossy and metallic and drop off. The leaders would begin to die back and then the limbs. And uh, then pretty soon the whole tree. But this takes a long time. So if you were a person looking at your iPhone, back and forth going to work, coming home, you would just go, Oh, there's a little bit going on with that tree. 
and then later you'd say, oh, well, that tree doesn't look so good. And it would take so long that you might not realize that that tree was going to end up dying because all the way down the trunk, it slowly, it was going to deteriorate. So that's a problem we have with thinking that we are people and the rest out there is just animals of nature. So when we think about these things, we have to realize that we're talking about the beauty of our land, we're talking about all the animals that are part of that beauty, and we're also talking about our food web because there are no animals that can be left out and it's okay. We all depend upon each other. And it also affects our watersheds because um, if we're losing trees, um, we're not going to have all, you know, I don't even have to explain that. It would just, the ripple effect would affect everything where we are. So to not totally depress you, I would have to say that there are things you could do. And one is not to be stumped by the idea that industry is way too big for us to do anything about. And of course we have to have cellular devices because that's just a logical, modern thing that has arrived on the scene. It's not logical, it's not safe, it's not even modern if you're ignoring all the other um, side effects of it. So we have agency as people, we can speak up, we can realize that legally people in official capacities, which would be somebody who runs a company, and would also be people in the government, are establishing a legal thing called lack of concern. And if they're establishing that they're not concerned about health or safety, and they just think, well, safety is how we define it, and we define it like this, and that isn't really a definition that matches with what we know scientifically, we as people can speak up about that. And I brought um, on the back table, I have some addresses and contact information for Ashland City Councilors, for Medford, for Phoenix, and for Talent. I did not get grants passed, but um, I can tell you if you want to contact them any way you feel comfortable doing it, you can say, I don't like this going with these cell towers going in. I don't know about it, but I want you to check into it because I think that's what you do as a city councilor. Anything you say to press a button that says, pay attention, this is big. So, um, Aliyah says to wrap it up, and I just <laughs> want to tell you, <laughs> thank you, Aliyah. I want to say, too, that if people could see, like animals, all of the electromagnetic background from the Earth, which is our very first wireless, and if we could see that and, and feel that and hear that, if we could also see, feel, and hear man-made radiation, we wouldn't be here today talking about this because we would all have all of our internet devices wired because it's safe that way. And we would all be safe and if there's another technology that would come along and make us very mobile again, we would be right on board with it, but we would know what to ask for and what to demand. So I encourage you all to be really vocal and onerous and a thorn in the side of all the people who you affect. So I haven't had time to give you lots and lots of examples of how animals are specifically affected, but I would say that if you uh, put, uh, experiments have shown that if you have 30 minutes contact with an ant's nest uh, from a router and then turn it off, the ants will go out to forage as they normally do, and tests have shown they don't, they get to maybe finding food and they don't know how to get back. Their motor control is compromised, and their memory also, they're confused. So after six to eight hours in the specific um, experiment that I'm re referring to right now, after six to eight, to eight hours, the ants recovered, but some of them died. So it took six to eight, eight hours to recover from 30 minutes exposure to a router. And of course, they're tiny, so we have an advantage in our size, but still the effects are the same. And um, 
Let me see. I have one other. Fire. We're very, very concerned about fire. And of course, we know that trees and plants communicate with each other. And uh, trees can communicate by interlacing their roots in order to keep a stand very strong in the event of a storm. And uh, we know that they also communicate in other ways, for instance, uh, and this concerns fire, is that when a plant is, or a tree is being uh, stressed, like from a pest, a beetle, a fungus, something like that, that is um, compromising its health, it will emit uh, alkaloids. And in the case of trees and plants, it's called terpenes, or, or not terpenes, but terpenes or terpenoids. It's a kind of alkaloid resin. And they emit that because it, they taste nasty and it will keep pests away and it might kill fungus and that sort of thing also. And when they do that, it drifts on the wind to other trees that aren't necessarily right next to them, but even out in a broader um, drift. And those plants and trees will also uh, respond in the same way to protect themselves. So. Um, it's like spraying a, a light finish of gasoline on leaves. And where we live, right next to the forest, and where most people live, this is a bad idea. And that's also something that we should be considering and asking our people who are uh, concerned about fire and trying to uh, make us safe. We ask them to look at that as well. I want to tell you one more thing, and that's about uh, birds. Alfonso Balmori in Spain has done a lot of study on uh, birds, and particularly the white storks. And in a traditional nesting place there, uh, he studied birds after the erection of cell towers in the vicinity of this nesting site. And birds are not averse to a nesting near people, and a lot of other birds are not either. But when the cell towers came up, uh, Birds started to fight with each other instead of cooperatively building a nest. They would drop sticks and argue over them, and the nest wouldn't get built. Their plumage deteriorated. Um, they would have motor problems. And if they had any chicks and they hatched, they might die. So it was really deleterious to them. And the same things happened with rock doves, magpies, collared doves, and other species. So. We're seriously talking about not, not just uh, nature, we're talking about our future in nature. We're talking about, um, um, as I said, our food webs and our watersheds. So I think that's all I wanted to say, and uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dale Benjamin, and I'd like to talk today about some letters that we've been working on. It's the activi a activism part of our organization. I've been working with the organization for a couple of years. Um, we now have a Facebook presence, so if you're on Facebook, you can look at us at, uh, for, your, for our Freedom to Say No page. And these letters that um, Tim and I are going to talk about and summarize are um, available on that page. And if you uh, sign, go, go to the change.org uh, link and sign on, it'll be, this letter will be emailed and distributed to a number of uh, representatives as well as the Attorney General who it's addressed to. So I'm going to summarize a letter that we sent in September. Um, and you can still sign on to it and get it out there. So this letter asserts a lack of communication on the part of Pacific Power and the Oregon PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, about smart meters. Come closer to that. OK, thank you. In that they failed to inform customers and made decisions which ignored recent peer-reviewed scientific studies. The public is being exposed to exponential increases in radio frequency radiation, which I'll also refer to as RFR going forward, from smart meters, communication infrastructure such as cell towers, Wi-Fi, and those phones we carry around with us, which we are just beginning to see the cumulative effects of. 5G will expose us all to significantly greater amounts of this non-ionizing RFR, which if deployed will make us and our children guinea pigs in a research study. Remember, just a few decades ago, doctors were promoting the benefits of smoking tobacco. It always seems to take too long and too much human sacrifice to establish relationships between cancers and their underlying causes. Senator Richard Blumenthal, in February 7, 2019, in a report stated, quote, wireless carriers can see they are not aware of any independent scientific studies on the safety of 5G, unquote. Our letter identifies 
both the FDA requested $30 million 10 year 2004 National Toxicology Report and the Ramazzini Institute study from, it, from Italy. These studies prove that long term exposure to low intensity, non thermal levels of microwave radiation can cause DNA damage and cancer in the animal model. And that's not just me talking. That's a quote from Joel Moskowitz, uh, who's a PhD. Dr. Ron Melnick, whom Alan spoke of earlier during the science presentation, served as a toxicologist for 28 plus years at the National Institute of Environmental Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. In 2018, he reviewed the study, which, which was designed, as Alan spoke about, to test the null hypothesis in that cell phone radiation at non-thermal levels could not cause adverse health effects. In contrast, the study showed significant increases in gliomas and glial cell hyperplasias in the brain and schwannomas and Schwann cell hyperplasias cancers in the heart cells of rats, of male rats. Dennis Richardson, resident of Central Point, um, for, former uh, rep, um, representative, was diagnosed with glioblastoma of the brain in May of 2018. He passed away in February, just last February of 2019. John McCain was diagnosed with a glioblastoma of the brain in uh, July of 2017. He passed away in August of 2018. Ted Kennedy, um, Bo Biden, former Attorney General of Delaware and an Iraq uh, war veteran, also uh, were diagnosed with glioblastomas. These are the kind of people that spend a lot of time on cell phones. So, and safe levels. Of course, we spoke about that before in the 40s. 1940s, the people who were working with the new, then new radar technology began reporting harmful effects including headaches, internal bleeding, heart conditions, brain tumors, and cataracts. These complaints prompted the FCC to establish emission levels as safe if it doesn't result in adverse biological effects caused by heating or cooking, which we now know um, are way too high, those levels. So we don't want to be put in microwaves, uh, ovens. Both the NTP and Ramazzini studies prove that there are biological effects at much lower levels than approved by the FCC. China, Russia, Italy, France, and Switzerland have set public RFR exposure limits 100 to 1,000 times less than the FCC, which in 2018 remain the highest levels in the world that are allowed in industrialized nations. Then we could talk about the FCC as a captured agency with a revolving door from which politicians and telecommunication lobbyists enter and exit on a regular basis. The letter concludes with a number of demands addressed to the Attorney General, Ellen Rosenblum, as follows, that all providers of these technologies notify their customers that these studies exist and place prominent warnings on RFR emitting devices. Two, they require five, that, um, she require 5G technology be proven safe by independent authorities before proceeding any further, further in Oregon. Three, require third-party testing of each device, including smart meters installed, to ensure they do not exceed the FCC exposure standard, which, as we discussed, far exceed those allowed in other industrialized countries, and impose penalties for companies that do not comply. And finally, four, replace any utility smart meter installed with safe and reliable, a safe and reliable analog meter upon customer request and at no additional cost. So um, we have these letters available to review. We'll also get them posted on our website. You can go to change.org and sign on. And um, we would really appreciate it if you do and like us. Go to our Facebook page and please do like us so we can get, get the word out. And um, visit our website at freedom to say no to smartmeters.org with the number two or you can spell it out. And I thank you all for coming and hope you found this um, informative. And we really appreciate you. Spread the word. Thanks. My name is Tim Westbelt. I'm uh, a life coach and uh, therapist uh, in Jacksonville, and uh, I've been involved in the, the Freedom to Say No to Smart Meters uh, Steering Committee, doing activism work for, I don't know how long it's been, a year and a half or two years now. These two letters are available uh, as petitions on change.org. And if you go to change.org, you can find a link to, to, to these petitions on our website and sign the petition. Every time you sign the, pe the petition, a minimum of 63 people in, in government, in uh, state offices like the Attorney General's office, the, well, the Deputy Attorney General's office, uh, will get an email. The Attorney General will, will not get an email because she doesn't have an, e an email capability. Oh, sorry. Uh, the Attorney General will not direct the email, but we're going to make sure she gets a hard copy of, uh, of this letter of both of the writers. Uh, 
So yeah, if you sign the petition, then at least 63 people in uh, state and federal leg legislators and, uh, and government agencies will get emails every single time somebody signs a petition. So uh, please do that. We want to get the word out to, to state government. Um, this, this letter that I want to talk about uh, asserts that, I'll just read this, that Oregon citizens were not adequately informed about the state's plans and deliberations related to the smart meter rollout in Oregon in a manner that would allow the public to actually be able to influence the decision-making process. Uh, the Oregon law is clear. ORS 192.620 reads, the Oregon form of government requires an informed public aware of the deliberations and decisions of governing bodies and the information upon which such decisions were made. 